William Maxwell Everts February 6, 1818, to February 28, 1901, was an American lawyer and statesman from New York who served as U.S. Secretary of State, U.S. Attorney General and U.S. Senator from New York. He was renowned for his skills as a litigator and was involved in three of the most important causes of American political jurisprudence in his day, the impeachment of a president, the Geneva arbitration and the contests before the Electoral Commission to settle the presidential election of 1876. A eulogist summarized his career thus, Mr. Everett's most conspicuous, perhaps sole, title to fame is, that he was a great lawyer and brilliant advocate. His study of legal principles was profound, his acquaintance with literature was wide, his ideas of professional ethics were exalted. He held great national offices, but his title to them was rather as lawyer than statesman. <laughs> <laughs> Family, education and marriage William M. Everts was born on February 6, 1818, in Charlestown, Massachusetts, the son of Jeremiah Everts and Mehitable Barnes Sherman. Everts's father, a native of Vermont, a lawyer of fair practice and good ability, and later the editor of The Panoplist, a religious journal, and corresponding secretary of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions during a time of fervor in mission propagandism who led the fight against Indian removals, died when William was 13. William's mother was the daughter of Roger Sherman, Connecticut founding father, a signatory to the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. Everts attended Boston Latin School, then Yale College, his father's college, class of 1801. In his college class were Morrison Waite, later Chief Justice of the United States, Samuel J. Tilden, future New York governor and Democratic presidential nominee and one of the contestants in the Electoral Commission's controversy in which Everts acted as counsel for the Republicans, chemist Benjamin Silliman Jr. and Edwards Pierpont, later United States Attorney General. While at Yale he became a member of two secret societies, the literary and debate-oriented Lenonian Society and Skull and Bones, he later extolled the former and much later denounced all such secret societies. Everts was one of the founders of Yale Literary Magazine in 1836. He graduated third in his class in 1837, after college he moved to Windsor, Vermont, where he taught school in order to save enough to pay for his legal studies. He then attended Harvard Law School, where won the respect of professors Joseph Story and Simon Greenleaf. He married Helen Minerva Bingham Wardner in 1843. She was the daughter of Alan Wardner, a prominent businessman and banker who served as Vermont State Treasurer. They had 12 children between 1845 and 1862, all born in New York City. Topic private practice After law school Everts came to New York and entered the law office of Daniel Lord, he was admitted to the bar in 1841. One of his first cases involved the trial of the infamous forger Monroe Edwards. Everts served as a junior counsel for the defense, which was headed by Senator John J. Crittenden of Kentucky. Edwards was convicted, but Everts' handling of his duties earned him notice as a promising lawyer. In 1851, Everts began his partnership with Charles F. Southmade. The firm was then named Butler, Everts and Southmade, a partnership that would last for the rest of his professional career in one form or the other. In 1859, Everts invited Joseph Hodges Choate to join the firm, which then became Everts, Southmade and Choate, and the firm then had a trial litigator in many ways as talented as Everts. But it was Southmade that Everts depended on to prepare the case, because Southmade, it was said, was a lawyer of remarkable knowledge and capacity and dexterity in working up a case, in court, especially before a jury. However, it was Everts who shined. In 1855, the state of Virginia hired attorneys, among which the eminent Charles O'Connor, to contest the decision of the New York Superior Court releasing eight black slaves in the famous Lemon Slave case. When Ogden Hoffman, the New York Attorney General died, the New York Legislature appointed Everts to replace him, and he argued to uphold the decision. The Appellate Division affirmed the ruling, and Virginia again appealed. Everts again represented the state in the New York Court of Appeals and again prevailed. The case generated widespread interest in both New York and the southern states, and Everts's arguments were reported in the daily press, as was nearly every step in the case. Thurlow Weed said that in view of his arguments Everts placed beyond doubt his right to be ranked among the foremost lawyers of the country. In 1856 Everts represented the widow of Henry Parrish, who was the proponent of his will and codicils in probate. 
His brothers contested the will on the ground of incapacity and undue influence. The brothers had been the decedent's executor in the will, but by codicil executed after he was struck with paralysis that rendered him nearly speechless were removed. The proceedings took on a bleak house like life of its own, the Dickens novel having only been published three years before, with eminent counsel on all sides. The estate was worth over $1.5 million at the beginning of the trial. There were 111 days of testimony before the surrogate and two weeks of oral argument before the case closed on November 23, 1857. The surrogate admitted the will and the first codicil removing the brothers as executors and bequeathing them the residue of the estate but rejected the second and third providing for $50,000 in charitable bequests. After four and a half years of appeal, involving two arguments before the Court of Appeals the judgment was affirmed. The Times concluded, the three volumes of evidence reveal a web of fact, experience and motive, rarely matched in works of fiction, and the three remaining volumes of briefs and arguments exhibit an array of learning, ingenuity and sustained ability, that will always place this suit in the front rank of the causes celebers of American jurisprudence. As a result of this case his firm would be entrusted with many larges estates, including that of the Astors. The most fame Everts ever received for a case, however, came in 1875 when he represented nationally famous clergyman Henry Ward Beecher in a suit for unlawful conversation, unlawful sexual intercourse by Beecher with the wife of plaintiff Theodore Tilton and the alienation of his wife's affections. The case was a national sensation, but despite what appeared to be clear evidence, Everts obtained a hung jury for his client. In fact, only three of the twelve jurors voted in favor of Tilton. Everts's courtroom style was summarized as follows H is long sentences, which, in the period when he was most conspicuous in the public mind, were often marveled over, never seemed to impair the clarity of his arguments, the vein of humor he could infuse in the driest case, the logic and vigor of his utterances, the soundness of his information, the great thoroughness of his preparation, were all factors in his success. But, of course, these do not account altogether for his triumph as an advocate, which was largely due to his positive genius for that kind of work." Another observer described his style, In none of his ways has he the magnetism of a great speaker. He has a clear, sharp, ringing voice, though it is not powerful or musical. His action is sparing, but effective. In making his points he is lucid, precise and cogent, seldom rhetorical or ornamental. He has an easy colloquial way, he is never in haste and never hesitates. His style is classic in its correctness. His sentences are long and faultless, and freighted with words which show that profound thought is selecting felicitous vocabulary as it goes along. He has a fine humor, but it is the humor of cultivation, not the coarse fun of the vulgar. His appeal to the intelligence of juries are the highest in their tone, the broadest in their scope and the deepest in their power of any in modern times. Early political career Everts early associated himself with the city's Whig interests dominated by Thurlow Weed. In 1849 he received the appointment of Assistant United States Attorney for the District of New York. He served until 1853. In 1851 he was also made a Commissioner of the Alms House later known as the Commissioners of Charity and Correction. The most famous case Everts was involved in while district attorney was against the famous journalist John L. O'Sullivan and his fellow filibusters, who had fitted out the Cleopatra to aid an insurrection in Cuba. After a month-long trial, the jury was unable to come to a verdict. Everts never showed the talent or inclination for electoral politics, but he early became relied on by party leaders to perform oratorical or public ceremonial functions. In early 1852 he made two major addresses at large meetings for Daniel Webster's candidacy, one in March at the Metropolitan Hall and the other in June at Constitution Hall right before the Whig National Convention. Everts's allegiance was out of touch not only with both the northern and southern factions of the Whigs but also with William H. Seward, who supported General Winfield Scott. Although most former Webster supporters belonged to the conservative wing of the Republican Party and Senator Seward the abolitionist end, Everts became an enthusiastic supporter of Seward. In 1860 he was chairman of the New York delegation to the Republican National Convention in Illinois, where his oratory was at the disposal of the senator, who most observers believed was a strong favorite for the nomination. James G. Blaine described the effects of those efforts on his audience. 
Seldom if ever in the whole field of political oratory have the speeches of Mr. Everts at Chicago been equaled. Even those who most decidedly differed from him followed him from one delegation to another allured by the charm of his words. He pleaded for the Republic, for the party that could save it, for the great statesman who had founded the party, and knew where and how to lead it. He spoke as one friend for another, and the great career of Mr. Seward was never so illumined as by the brilliant painting of Mr. Everts. It was Everts who placed Seward's name in nomination, and when it became apparent that Seward would not attain it, it was Everts, who, on behalf of Seward, graciously moved the unanimous nomination of Abraham Lincoln. In 1861 he ran against Horace Greeley for the Senate seat vacated by Seward who had become Lincoln's Secretary of State, but when neither could attain the requisite votes, the legislature settled on Ira Harris as a compromise. He served on New York's Union Defense Committee during the Civil War. He was a delegate to the New York State Constitutional Convention of 1867. At the Constitutional Convention he was a member of the Standing Committee on the Preamble and Bill of Rights and the Committee on the Judiciary. <laughs> <laughs> Service in the Johnson, Grant, and Hayes administrations At the age of 50, Everts was chief counsel for President Andrew Johnson during his impeachment trial. He delivered the closing argument for Johnson which secured his acquittal, an event that seemed unlikely when the trial began. Afterward Everts was appointed Attorney General following the Senate's refusal to reconfirm Henry Stanbury to the office, from which Stanbury had resigned in order to participate in Johnson's defense. Everts served as United States Attorney General from July 1868 until March 1869. In 1872, he was counsel for the United States before the Tribunal of Arbitration on the Alabama Claims in Geneva, Switzerland. His oral argument helped the United States recover on its claims for the destruction of Union military ships, commercial ships, and commercial cargo by the CSS Alabama and other Confederate ships which had been built in and sailed from British ports during the American Civil War. Everts was a founding member of the New York City Bar Association. He served as its first president from 1870 to 1879, the longest tenure of any president. Everts served as counsel for President-elect Rutherford B. Hayes before the Electoral Commission that resolved the disputed presidential election of 1876. During President Hayes' administration, he served as Secretary of State. Initially, Everts did not act upon reports of corruption in the Foreign Service and supported actions against internal whistleblowers John Myers, Wiley Wells and later John Mosby. However, when President Grant continued to hear such complaints during his post-presidential Around the World tour, and such were confirmed by internal troubleshooters Deb. Randolph Keim and former general turned consul to Japan Julius Stahl, Everts began to clean house before the 1880 election. He ultimately secured the resignation of a favorite subordinate, Frederick W. Seward, for shielding rascals, and then several consuls in the Far East, including George Seward, David Bailey and David Sickles. In 1881, Everts was a delegate to the International Monetary Conference at Paris. U.S. <inaudible> <inaudible> Senator Everts gained the support of state legislators in 1884 for U.S. Senator from New York, and from 1885 to 1891 he served one term. While in Congress 49th, 50th and 51st Congresses, he served as chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Library from 1887 to 1891. He was also a sponsor of the Judiciary Act of 1891 also known as the Everts Act, which created the United States Courts of Appeals. As an orator, Senator Everts stood in the foremost rank, and some of his best speeches were published. Chair of the American Committee for the Statue of Liberty Everts led the American fundraising effort for the pedestal for the Statue of Liberty, serving as the chairman of the American Committee. He spoke at its unveiling on October 28, 1886. His speech was entitled, The United Work of the Two Republics. Taking a breath in the middle of his address, he was understood to have completed his speech. The signal was given, and Bartholdi, together with Richard Butler and David H. King Jr., whose firm built the pedestal and erected the statue, let the veil fall from her face. 
A huge shock of sound erupted as a thunderous cacophony of salutes from steamer whistles, brass bands, and booming guns, together with clouds of smoke from the cannonade, engulfed the statue for the next half hour. Retirement Senator Everts retired from public life in 1891 due to ill health. He was still a partner in his law practice in New York City, called Everts, Southmoyd and Choate. He died in New York City and was buried at a Scutney Cemetery in Windsor, Vermont. Everts owned numerous properties in Windsor, Vermont, including Everts Pond and a group of historic homes often referred to as Everts Estate. The homes included 26 Main Street in Windsor. Everts purchased this house from John Skinner in the 1820s for $5,000. It was passed down to his daughter, Elizabeth Hoare Everts Perkins, who left the house to family members, including her son Maxwell Perkins. The house stayed in the family until 2005. 26 Main Street in Windsor, Vermont was later restored and reopened as Snapdragon Inn. Snapdragon Inn is open to the public and features a library that displays items related to the history of William M. Everts and his extended family. Topic extended family William Everts was a descendant of the English immigrant John Everts. The family settled in Salisbury, Connecticut in the 17th century. Everts was a member of the extended Baldwin, Hoare and Sherman families, which had many members in American politics. Ebenezer R. Hoare, a first cousin of Everts, was a U.S. Attorney General, Associate Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts and Representative in Congress. The two were best friends, and shared similar professional pursuits and political beliefs. Each served, in succession, as United States Attorney General. Some of Everett's other first cousins include U.S. Senator and Governor of Connecticut Roger Sherman Baldwin, U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, brother of Ebenezer R. George F. Hoare, and Sherman Day, California State Senator and founding trustee of the University of California. Son Alan Wardner Everett's graduated from Yale College in 1869. He supported the founding of Wolf's Head Society, and was first president of its alumni association. He held the position for a total of 20 years over two separate terms. He was a law partner, corporate president, and trustee of Vassar College. Son Maxwell Everts graduated from Yale College in 1884, where he was also a member of Skull and Bones. He served as a New York City district attorney, and later as general counsel for E. H. Harriman, which later became the Union Pacific Railroad. He was president of two Windsor, Vermont, banks, and the chief financial backer of the Gridley Automatic Lathe manufactured by the Windsor Machine Co. In politics, Maxwell served as a member of the Vermont House of Representatives and was a Vermont State Fair Commissioner. Grandson Maxwell E. Perkins became the noted editor of Charles Scribner's Sons, and dealt with authors F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe, Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings and James Jones. Great nephew Everts Boutel Green became a historian and was appointed Columbia University's first DeWitt Clinton Professor of History in 1923 and department chairman from 1926 to 1939. He was chairman of the Columbia Institute of Japanese Studies 1936 to 39. He was a noted authority on the American colonial and revolutionary war periods. Another relative, Henry Sherman Boutel, was a member of the Illinois State House of Representatives in 1884, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Illinois from 1897 to 1911, 6th District 1897 to 1903, 9th District 1903 to 11, a delegate to the Republican National Convention from Illinois in 1908 and U.S. Minister to Switzerland 1911 to 13. Great-great-nephew Roger Sherman Green II, the son of Daniel Crosby Green and Mary Jane Forbes Green, was the U.S. Vice Consul in Rio de Janeiro in 1903-04, in Nagasaki in 1904-05 and in Kobe in 1905, U.S. Consul in Vladivostok in 1907 and in Harbin 1909-11, and U.S. Consul General in Hankow, 1911-14. Great great nephew Jerome Davis Green 1874 to 1959 was president of Lee Higginson and Company 1917 to 32 secretary Harvard University Corporation 1905 to 10 and 1934 to 43 general manager of the Rockefeller Institute 1910 to 12 assistant and secretary to John D Rockefeller Jr as trustee of the Rockefeller Institute trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation trustee of the Rockefeller General Education Board 
1910–39, Executive Secretary, American Section, Allied Maritime Transport Council, in 1918, Joint Secretary of the Reparations, Paris Peace Conference, in 1919, Chairman, American Council Institute of Pacific Relations, 1929–32, Trustee of the Brookings Institution of Washington, 1928–45, and a founding member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Great grandson Archibald Cox served as a U.S. Solicitor General and Special Prosecutor during President Richard Nixon's Watergate scandal, whereas Everts defended a U.S. President Andrew Johnson in his impeachment trial. In a sense, they both successfully argued their cases, which represent two of the three U.S. presidential impeachment efforts. An impeachment trial was not held in Nixon's case. Nixon resigned before the House of Representatives acted on the House Judiciary Committee's recommendation that Nixon be impeached. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Legacy. On March 6, 1943, construction began on a United States Maritime Service Liberty ship in Everett's name. The SS William M. Everts hull identification number MS was launched April 22, 1943, and served during World War II in the European theater. It transported troops and supplies from its home port in Norfolk, Virginia to various ports on the Atlantic and Mediterranean coasts. After World War II, the ship was decommissioned and finally scrapped in 1961. See also List of Skull and Bones members Topic Notes Topic Sources Barrows, Chester Leonard, nineteen forty one. William M. Everts, Lawyer, Diplomat, Statesman. University of North Carolina Press. Choate, Joseph Hodges, nineteen twelve. Memorial of Charles F. Southmade. New York, Bar Association of the City of New York. Doherty, J. Hampton 1902. William M. Everts, Lawyer and Statesman. American Lawyer, 4-4-10, 59-65. Online via Heinonline.org Subscription Riku IRED, First Part, American Lawyer, Volume 4, Issue 1 January 1902, pp. 4 to 10, Second Part, American Lawyer, Volume 4, Issue 2, February 1902, pp. 59 to 65. Retrieved March 24, 2016. Khan, Yasmin Sabin, 2010. Enlightening the World: The Creation of the Statue of Liberty. Ithaca, New York: Cornell University Press. ISBN 9780801448515. NY Court of Appeals 1861. Report of the Lemon Slave Case, containing points and arguments of counsel on both sides, and opinions of all the judges. New York, New York, Horace Greeley & Co. Retrieved March 18, 2016. Robbins, Alexandra 2002. Secrets of the Tomb, Skull and Bones, The Ivy League, and the Hidden Paths of Power. Boston, Little, Brown & Company. ISBN 0-316-72091-7, unsigned, NYM&E March 1901. William Maxwell Everts. Albany Law Journal. pp. 107-112. Retrieved March 25, 2016. Online via Heinonline.org Subscription required. Reprinted from the New York Mail and Express, attribution This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Chisholm, Hugh, ed. 1911. Everts, William Maxwell. Encyclopædia Britannica. 10 11th ed. Cambridge University Press. p. 4. <laughs> Further reading United States Congress. William M. Everts, id. E. O. 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 Two Six Two. Biographical Directory of the United States Congress. Sherman Everts, editor. Introduction. Arguments and speeches of William Maxwell Everts. In three volumes. Boston and New York: Houghton Mifflin Company, 1919. Topic. External links. United States Congress. Everts, William Maxwell, id. E. 
Biographical Directory of the United States Congress. Works related to William M. Everts at Wikisource Works by William M. Everts at Project Gutenberg Works by or about William M. Everts at Internet Archive William M. Everts at Find a Grave William Maxwell Everts U.S. Department of Justice The Ebenezer Hoare Papers Everts, William Maxwell from 1818 to 1901 Papers from 1849 to 1887 Harvard Law School Library Eulogy on Chief Justice Chase by William Maxwell Everts at Project Gutenberg Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase Sherman Genealogy including families of Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk, England by Thomas Townsend Sherman Baldwin Green Gager Family of Connecticut at Political Graveyard Sherman Hoare Family at Political Graveyard William Maxwell Everts Letters, 1839-1905 Bulk 1839-1879 MS 235 held by Special Collection and Archives, Nimitz Library at the United States Naval Academy.